Good evening and welcome to the candidates. A four-part presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigerian Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. These town halls represent an opportunity for you to get to know the candidates who want your votes so they can lead Nigeria for the next four years. We are live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority on Wazobia Television, Orc TV, Plus TV, and Impact Africa Television. You can also hear this program on all Radio Nigeria stations across the country. And we are streaming live online at dtv.media and nta.ng live. Today, we are in conversation with the candidates of the ruling All Progressives Congress, the APC. <coughs> Retired General Muhammad Buhari was born on the 17th of December 1942 and is currently serving as the Commander-in-Chief of Nigerian Armed Forces and the President. He's a retired Major General in the Nigerian Army and previously served as the nation's Head of State from 31st December 1983 to 27th August 1985 following a military coup. In December 2014, he emerged as the presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress for the March 2015 general elections. He won those elections, defeating the incumbent president, Goodluck Jonathan. This marked the first time in the history of Nigeria that an incumbent president lost to an opposition candidate in a general election. His running mate is Professor Oluyemi Oluleke Oshibanjo, born 8th March 1957 in Lagos. He is, of course, currently serving as Nigeria's vice president. He's a lawyer, senior advocate of Nigeria, and also a professor of law. He has served as attorney general and commissioner for justice in Lagos State. Until his inauguration as vice president, he was a senior partner with Simmons Cooper Partners, a commercial law practice in Lagos. Welcome to the candidates, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Now with us tonight are also members of the diplomatic corps, civil society, political parties, and of course citizens who have questions for our candidates. I too will have some questions, but as important are also the questions that are coming from those of you watching us at home. So if you want to participate, here is how to do it. Send your questions on any of the following social media handles. On Twitter, at the Daria Media or NTA News Now. On Facebook, at the Daria Media. On Instagram, at Daria Media NG. Now, throughout these programs, these handles will scroll on your screen. And don't forget to use the hashtag NGTheCandidates. Otherwise, your questions may get lost. Again. Remember to tell your friends and family in the diaspora that they can watch this program online. We are streaming live on dtv.media and NTANG Live. Now, let me turn to Mr. President and Mr. Vice President. You've been ruling Nigeria now for close to three, almost four years. You want Nigerians to give you another opportunity to do another four years. Why? Well, I... I said it much earlier at our national uh, executive committee of our party that if my party recommends me to its executive, I will contest. And I did that to save time and wide discussions among members of the party. So those who felt very strongly about it, they left the party. And the party nominated me. Why? It's because I felt that uh, the three fundamental objectives we campaigned on in 2015 are still relevant. And uh, we want to remind Nigerians to See when we started, 2015, where we are now, what we have been able to do in between uh, this time of three and a half years with the resources and the time available to us. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. Vice President, do you want to add a little bit more to uh, talk, tell us a little bit more about why you think um, the Nigerian public should nominate you and Mr. President again to serve for another four years? Yes, I think so. I think um, Mr. President has already uh, pointed out that uh, we had we campaigned on three uh, fundamental issues. Uh, namely the economy, corruption, and the fight against corruption and security. And um, in those three respects, we believe that uh, we have laid very strong foundations. And I very strongly believe that um, we are on to uh, much, much, pro much more, more progress if uh, given a second opportunity. I uh, very strongly uh, take the view that the period of three and a half years in particular has been one where we have managed to turn around uh, a lot of what was inherited in the previous 16 years. And the previous 16 years were, in my view, a period which uh, a, lot, well, a lot of revenue came in, but very little appeared to have been done. And we believe that the foundations we've laid in agriculture, foundations we've laid, uh, and I'm sure Mr. President will elaborate on that as we go on, in infrastructure, the foundations we've laid there really deserve a second time for completion. But I'm sure we'll come around to, to those specific issues. Absolutely. But um, you, you talked about the three things that you fought the first elections with and which you think you've done well. So maybe if we could take them one by one and see whether we can have a conversation. Let's start with corruption, because that was a big thing that uh, the president um, uh, fought on. There's a perception that um, the general corruption fight that we see under this administration is a little bit skewed and that it focuses on people who are not pro-government or who are not friends of this government or who belong to an opposition party. How do you respond to those allegations? Which allegations? That your corruption fight focuses only on people who are opponents of the APC or who are not friends of the APC. Well, I... Um... I think it's, it's, uh, that's not a fair criticism or observation because it's not backed by facts. Um, I don't think there is anybody that has been uh, pointed out as corrupt in the last dispensation which we look the other direction. Um, I think I, best, I can best illustrate uh, my experiences on this. When I came in uniform in 1984, we arrested uh, the president, the vice president, uh, the governors, the ministers, and uh, put them in detention and said they are guilty until they can prove themselves innocent. We put committees of investigation almost based on geopolitical zones. And those that were uh, investigated, except two Nigerians, late Biamun Usman, a junior minister of education, and late Adam Churuma, a governor of Central Bank, and a minister of finance, were the only people who were found to have managed their resources with integrity. But I myself eventually was arrested and detained. And those people who were found guilty of misappropriating public funds were given back uh, what they were misappropriating through thorough committee investigation. It's not just an allegation. They were given the chance to, to talk. So I, I decided to come now, and now I have to be careful. Um, people are just not arrested like that. But when they hold positions, if they made a wrong declaration, <laughs> it's just one point. They, they didn't uh, mention how many houses they have in Europe and America or Asia. And they didn't mention the companies they floated and the contracts they gave them. It's eventually uncovered. They are faced in court with the documents. So, Mr. President, you're here 
obviously referring to the case of the Chief Justice of the Federation. Or who are you referring to? Did you, is that an example? Because you talked about people who are not declaring. This is what is topical now, and I'm wondering whether that is the case you are referring to. I'm sorry, you have to refuse that question again. Okay. Let me ask it another way. <laughs> um, you've talked about people who do wrongdoing and being investigated. There are cases of people that are thought to be very close to you. An example is the former secretary to the federal government, Malam Babachir, um, allegedly accused of um, uh, taking money that was meant for IDPs and awarding contracts to himself. As far as we know, the EFCC has not investigated him, even though he has lost his job. He is one of few other examples of people who are in government who've got petitions against them in front of the EFCC, and the EFCC is not investigating. And the general perception is that the reason why those investigations are not taking place is because these are people who are either close to the government who are, who are in government. Well, I, I'm not too clear about your question, but uh, if you can mention the names. I'll give you an example. Yes. Yeah. Um, your, I said Baba Chir, the former SGF, the Minister of um, Housing, Mr. Raji Fashola. There's a petition in front of the EFCC by an NGO. Um, and as far as I know, that has not been investigated. Um, so are you, well, I'm trying to understand whether you are aware of these things and if this is part of, as it is, as it is alleged, part of a policy not to investigate people in government. Well, uh, we, we can't, um, to be fair to individuals, I, I told you why I have to be careful. And if anybody, the public should help us, um, if there are strong allegations and people backed it up by evidence, bank accounts, names of companies floated, contracts awarded, then we take them uh, before the courts, through EFCC and ICPC. Um, and we have to trust the system and allow them to complete the investigation. Um, if we just, um, just take people in, as we did, you are in the military area, and lock them up, uh, this, this system, the present system, multi-party democracy system, does not uh, approve that. If you accuse any person, you have to produce the evidence in court for him to be prosecuted. So if there is strong allegation, the government may decide to ask people to go, like the former secretary to the government you mentioned. We ask him to go. But if anybody... But the question is, after asking him to go, how come he hasn't been prosecuted, which is what Nigerians are wondering. If there was a strong enough evidence to ask him to go, it means there's an indication that maybe he did something wrong. Why hasn't he been presented before a court still and before, charged with corrupt practices? I, mean, before, I think the matter is already before the EFCC. And um, I believe that, uh, in fact, the, a directive has been issued regarding uh, all persons who have cases before the EFCC. I'm sure that you will find that each and every person who has an allegation against them and has been duly investigated will be put on trial without a doubt, okay. each person. Okay, let me specifically come to you because yes. the National Assembly has also raised um, what they say are concerns about money um, that was misspent within a, the presidential unit on the Northeast. You chair that unit and they say you basically um, appropriated money without going through due protocol. How do you respond to that allegation? You know, I think the allegation was that uh, the money, that some money which was uh, approved for the emergency intervention in the Northeast was without appropriation. Yes. But that's not correct at all. And we pointed out very clearly to them that while I was acting president, the sums of money in question were duly appropriated. As a matter of fact, if they had looked, and we've shown all the evidence to them, and I do not think that we have since got a reply from them, what we were able to show them was very clearly this. The, the 
CBN, that's the Central Bank of Nigeria, controls the strategic reserves, uh, agricultural strategic reserves. They are the ones who would raise the memo to me saying specifically what was required for the Northeast intervention and where the funds will be, will, will, will be taken from. The funds were taken from what is called the rice levy, which is a duly appropriated fund. And after that, we then, I then approved the sum of money, properly appropriated. Are you at all concerned about some of the allegations raised about that, the, the, the spending with that particular fund and the way they are running the affairs of the agency? I'm not, I'm not at all concerned about it. I believe that, unfortunately, a, a good part of that was politicized and, you know, allegations are flying here and there. That was a very comprehensive, very, very comprehensive process. What happened was that after the World Food Program had said that they were no longer able to feed the numbers that they were feeding before, there was a need for us to intervene because hundreds of people were coming out. So it was an of, emergency situation. Oh, yeah, it was an emergency situation. And then what then happened was we then took a very detailed process. As I said it started from the central bank, the central bank and the strategic reserves. We have four companies that hold our strategic reserves, and they are major grain companies. Olam, Walcott, uh, Dangote, I believe there's one more that I, I can't remember their name. They hold the strategic reserves for the central bank. So everything was done properly. The Nigerian, the Nigerian armed forces, the army, the air force, the navy, all of them, the police, all of them were involved in the distribution process, including the air force. Each service chief sent a senior representative to be involved in the, in the process of distribution. We then went a further step. We created uh, an office in Maiduguri where we have a tracking device. We could actually see the buses, or the, sorry, the trucks, as they went from point to point from our, from our offices in Maiduguri. We then included members of the National Assembly from the Northeast Zone to ensure that they that they were carried along and they understood what so exactly. So why do you think the National Assembly would make such a serious allegation? Well, the National Assembly, as you know, I mean, I, I think that what they were saying was, and, and the reason why they were saying whatever they said, it would be left to them. But I think that as far as we are concerned, we went through the appropriate process and we did the distribution appropriately. I don't know exactly, if you look at the whole, if you look at the entire report, the only line of that report where there was any kind of allegation, at least against me, was to say the money was not duly appropriated by the National Assembly. But we proved that that money was duly appropriated by the National Assembly. And there was no further allegation, as far as I could see, you know, concerning my participation as, okay. as, as acting president at the time. Now, the National Assembly, in talking about this, quoted Section 80, subsection 4 which basically says that you can't appropriate any money, whether it's from the consolidated account or anything considered public funds, without going to the National <laughs> Assembly. <laughs> and in their view, that process didn't take place. The, the point I'm making is that their view was absolutely wrong because it wasn't based on facts. We provided for them evidence that they obviously did not have at the time when they were making their conclusion. And that evidence, was the fact that the Central Bank of Nigeria was the one that originated the memorandum from an appropriated fund. That fund is called the Rice Levy. The Rice Levy is a line item in our budget, so it's already appropriated by the National Assembly. Okay. So I, I think, think that like they, they to, were wrong. Yeah, let's <laughs> open up the conversation. a town hall. I don't yes. want to dominate it. I want to give people an opportunity to, to ask questions. So um, there are two mics, and um, we'll call maybe two, three people. Please introduce yourself, ask your question, go back and sit down, and then we'll come back to Mr. President and Mr. Vice President. Okay, so the gentleman in glasses, yes, please, from this end. Um, at the other end, yes, sir, you. And then there's a lady right at the back, I think and the gentleman in the brown hat as well. Okay. Uh, good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Usman Suleiman Jaun. I'm a lawyer. Now, my question is um, specifically to Mr. President on the issue of Almajiri. Now, 
I'm sure, sure. this is sure. Almajiri, Almajiri. Almajiri. In the northern. Almajiri. Almajiri. Almajiri, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Your Excellency, this, I believe, a major challenge for us in the northern part of the country. Now, I'm sure so many don't believe it's something we should continue to do. So what's your opinion on that? And I strongly think it's important, Your Excellency, if you can do something about it. Now, this is because uh, we've yep. seen it that you're one of those that um, can make difficult decisions and that can be affect, uh, accepted in Nigeria. Okay. The foil subsidy, for example. No, no, so no I you've do asked believe your question. It's about Algeria. Now, now I do I've got believe other people who need to talk. Yeah, I, I do believe if, if Mr. President can do something about it, uh, I'm sure it can help okay. that acceptance. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The next person, please. Yes, sir. Please come. Yes. Good evening, Mr. President, sir. This, my question is this. How soon will Please, we national... Please, can you introduce yourself? My name Start is Usman name. Abu Bakr, a teacher. How soon will the National Livestock Development Plan will be implemented so as to address the challenges facing this sector? Thank you, Mr. President. What, livestock. Huh? Livestock, livestock plan. National Livestock. I, I will talk about that. I will talk about that. I'm sir. the chairman of the... I will talk what about is it? Okay. National Livestock Thank plan. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Livestock Plan. Yes. Okay. My name is Richard Ezekiel. I stand here on behalf of uh, 25 million persons with disabilities in Nigeria. I just want to ask how far about the disability bill? Okay. How far about? With the disability bill. The disability, disability bill. Yes. Disability. Yes. We'll take what? one more question. About the disability bill. We'll come back the to bill the Mr. President. Mr. President. Yes. Hasn't very far Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Omotaya Motosho, a television broadcaster. I remember when I interviewed you about two and a half years ago, you did mention a very, very germane point that if we don't fight corruption, corruption will kill us. I stand here today, Mr. President, with a heavy heart to let you know that the corruption that you are fighting, some Nigerians are not supporting, and we must support you. What caused the heavy heart? If we had been fighting corruption collectively with you, we would have been able to save some good funds to divert onto other sectors of our economy. Okay. On December 22nd, I lost a close sister of mine. Ma'am, we with need two to younger the... sisters in car accident due to bad roads. As a journalist, I know this administration is doing their best, but we do not have enough funds to be able to tidy the bad roads that we have. Okay, thank she you. She died much. with two other sisters, thank three you. daughters of one mother on Ijebode Ore, Benin Road. Chief Mrs. Arietta Vani and Francisca and the other lady. Three of them, they are my close relatives. We lost them in that accident. If we fight corruption collectively, I am advising every Nigerian to join this administration to fight corruption. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I have to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll come back to you and Mr. President so that we can answer the questions. Yeah, let's, let's take a quick break. Please don't go away. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigerian Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. We are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the ruling APC, the incumbent president and of course the vice president, retired General Muhammad Buhari and Professor Yemi Oshibanjo. A quick reminder for those watching at home, you can still take part by sending your questions using the social media handles scrolling across the screen. We will do our best to ask as many questions as possible. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, before the break, we took a few questions from members of the audience. There was a question about what your plans are for the Almajiris in the north. There was a question about uh, the livestock plan. And finally, there was a question about the disability bill. Um, because there are about 25 million people thought to live with some form of disability 
in Nigeria, and people are interested in knowing what this government um, is going to do about uh, improving their situation. Yes, sir. So maybe we start with the Almajiri with Mr. President. Yes, what the Almajiri case, um, I think um, uh, we have to look at the three tiers of government responsibilities. The federal, the state, and the local governments. And the allocation of resources, revenue allocation formula, and so on. Relative to the resources available to the country, budgets are dispensed to the three-tier government system. So the question of al Majri's case, this lack of virtually primary, the basic education, are all lo local government problems. Even if, even if the center has extra money, they wouldn't take it and build classrooms, equip them, employ qualified teachers from the federal uh, revenue while it is the duty of the local, local governments. If the local governments are not being given the money by the governors or by the states, then it's up to the the, the local governments to come together and scream loud enough for Nigerians to hear them so that, uh, so that the, 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 there will be proper allocation of resources uh, by the constitutional means. Mr. President, uh, that part is, of... That's for the al -Majiris. Yes, sir. Let me just ask a little follow-up questions regarding that. P part of the, the frustrations that some people have with the way... Nigeria is structured is that we seem to have sometimes confusion. So technically, we'd sort of say something like primary education resides with local government, but then you have agencies like the Universal Basic Education Agency, which is a federal agency and which has some role to play in primary education. And, and part of this confusion um, is why people will say, for example, we need to restructure and move some things from exclusive list, from concurrent list to the residual list. What are your thoughts regarding restructuring, particularly in relation to education? Well, my, my thought is that um, firstly, there must be a lot of education. And this I, I recommend should be led by the press to expose uh, what the relationship the how effective the governments are dispensing to local governments monies, you know, from, from the center. Uh, if that is not done, then uh, it is it's very difficult for the federal government under this dispensation to enforce uh, education at all levels by respective states, either the state, the local governments, or the center, the, the center itself. I will give, I think, some, 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 some examples of this. In, um, in some of the investigations, it was uncovered that uh, local government chairmen were made to sign for the money that are supposed to be their allocation but they will only be given about 25% uh, of the money. The rest will be taken by the governor. Mm -hmm. There are investigations in some of the states that are showing that. So I am expecting the press on behalf of the people to make an in-depth investigation and expose corrupt governors you know, and local government chairmen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Well, would, would you... be willing to re-examine the UBEC funds because those reside with the federal government and yet they are actually meant for primary education. So they are normally disbursed, I believe, by the federal government. Well, I, I think what has happened so far anyway with the UBEC, I, I think there are agencies of government, federal agencies, that in some senses support, uh, uh, the, they support local government and states. But the bulk, I mean clearly, Primary education, as Mr. President has said, lies squarely in the hands of local governments and all of that. But 
I think with UBEC, what happened with UBEC is that UBEC has an arrangement where they say if, if the state, uh, it, so, so, if, so if, they, if there's 20 million for a state, they'll say, well, the state should bring its own counterpart funding of a certain amount of money, it could be 20% or 25%. Now, that percentage is what the states ought to bring to the table before they have access to the UBEC fund. Mm -hmm. Most states never accessed the UBEC funds. They simply said they didn't have the counterpart funding. But, but what has don't, happened? Don't you find excuse that me, problematic, excuse me, though? Excuse me. What has happened now? Mm -hmm. What has happened now is that from the Paris Club reforms that was given to the states, the federal government now paid off all of their counterpart funding. Mm -hmm. So all states can now, can now access <laughs> UBEC funds without any hindrance whatsoever. Okay. Now, the other questions are to do with disability and with the livestock plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. The livestock plan, I think... The is, disability. Yes, yeah, okay, we'll start with disability. Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Well, I, I honestly cannot remember um, this uh, the plan being taken to the National Assembly mm -hmm. and how much uh, they have commented yes. on it and send it back to the center. It's the same thing with the disability bill. Um, there are so much with the, uh, with the um, National Assembly. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, I expect, honestly, the elite, the press through the elite, to keep an eye on the activities, on the bills, between the executive and the uh, National Assembly. Uh, if the executive send a bill, they can hardly uh, put it in the budget unless it is returned from the National Assembly with their comments or with their recommendations. So we, we will find out what's happening with that bill with the National Assembly and then maybe But we'll a lot of time has been wasted. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, Mr. President. Now, um, I, I'd like to do a little follow-up question regarding this livestock because um, the, we got a question from a, a listener, and I'll try and dig up their name, where they were asking, how do you intend to bring uh, a permanent stop to the difficulties and the conflict going on between farmers and herdsmen? No, um, I, I, yeah, so, so the conflict I mean, the conflict between farmers oh, and, the and, herds, yes, and herders. Well, um, uh, it's, it's what, what happened uh, started from Benway State um, was unfortunate. And um, we foresaw that. When I say we, I mean the federal government. And we asked the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development to go to the archives and find out the gazettes from the First Republic where those incredible leadership of the First Republic, there was cattle root, there was grazing areas with limited resources. They put windmills, half dumps, uh, and even veterinary clinics but uh, subsequent very important personalities encroached on the cattle routes, on the grazing areas. And if a herder has 200 cattle, they have just e eaten, they, they, whichever their way to, to the water port, they will just uh, go through there. And the, I think the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Water Resources have produced the maps. The encroachment. But, but, but these are old maps, and, and this is today's problem. So we might have had a solution to this many years ago in the 60s with the routes and everything, but clearly that solution is no longer tenable now. And so the issue is, this is these are urgent problems that we're facing now. People are dying. People are getting killed. Conflict is breaking out. Um, what are we going to do about it, like now? What we are doing about, we have already started. And uh, we have to ask uh, 
especially the governors. The movement is from north to south and is quite predictable. Um, after the harvest, you know, they, they, the cattle have to move south for water and, and faster. And then our borders, for example, between Lake Chad and uh, Benin River, about 1,400 kilometers, was Niger alone. And look at the Cameroon's one. And uh, to effectively serve that uh, border, when structures were tampered with in terms of cattle routes and grazing areas, uh, it, it, it's very difficult. We have sent this thing back through the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development to the governors so that we can create these corridors. But for a government like Benue government, when they said they have banned um, cattle rearing or they have banned grazing, uh, we are in the same country. Um, I expect a government to insist on the routes to be re-established in the grazing areas. But to say that uh, cattle cannot move is it, very difficult. Benue is complaining, but I understand they are already in, in Belsa. From there, are they going into the Atlantic? <laughs> the, uh, okay, let me, Mr. Let me, Mr. Mr. Add, President, yeah, but can, let, I, can let, I just quickly... Let me, because, add, because you know, let, me okay, a, let me add a comment to that. Um, part of what... Because when the matter was referred to the governors, uh, I chaired the committee, the National Economic Council, and um, part of the plan that the National Economic Council laid out was called the, uh, the Livestock Transformation Plan. All of the governors uh, in the so-called frontline states were also involved in this. And I think that one of the very important points that emerged from the discussions at the National Economic uh, Council was the fact that there was a need to ensure that we were able to create some access to places, to grazing areas. And I think that that's the point also that Mr. President is making, that in order to be, for instance, anywhere where cattle are, you must still have some kind of access so that you then have an area where it could be a ranch, it could just be a place where you have earth dams, it could be a place where you just have water, where, you know, whatever it is. And we then agreed with the governors that, because federal government has no land, only state governors, the state governments have land. We then agreed with the, uh, with the state governments that, okay, anyone that is willing, you will put together the resources. If private people want to put together the resources, they can build uh, those areas. They could be called ranches or grazing areas, whatever you call them. And people will pay appropriate fees. The cattle rearers will pay appropriate fees, use the facilities, and go back whenever they want to go back. Because clearly, somebody has to bring those cattle to that point. And we tried to say that that was an interim phase. Because as time goes on, you, may, you, you will, will eventually be able to stop uh, grazing from one point to the other. Well, but that can, will take time. Yeah, well, so the point is basically, uh, Mr. President himself owes you know, cattle, everybody knows. He's very proud of his cows in Daura and talks about them all the time. But the perception is that he, um, Mr. President, is a little bit biased because these are his people that are involved and that instead of facing the fact that in the 21st century there's really no room for the cattle rearing in the way we're doing it and coming up with modern ways of cattle rearing, we're trying to hold on to an old-fashioned way of rearing meat. No, but you pointed out already. Let me, let me, uh, let me be Mr. President's counsel. You pointed out already that he has his cattle in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a ranch, in a farm. You know, and I don't think that's old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is very... That's, that is current. That you have your, uh, somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I think that the matter, really, is one, as I said, that is within the province of the National Economic Council. And that's why the governors took it up. Because the federal government, cannot determine what will happen in any state because the states themselves pass laws on their land and the use of their land. We don't have land except federal land. So there's really no way that we can do much with that. And that's why we decided to hold the National Economic Council meetings 
set up a committee on the livestock transformation plan, and we're working with the state governments. And many of the state governments have given land for purposes of ranching. They've given land for purposes as grazing areas. We are building earth dams in many of the different states. Okay. And I'm the chairman of that particular committee. Now, the thing is this, though. When you think in terms of the problem that mm -hmm. farmers and herders are going through, it's a problem that goes beyond um, uh, the right of way. Because obviously, there's uh, issues around climate change. And I am still a little bit confused about what the government policy is that underpins you know, our, our, the way we deal with issues around climate, which are sort of the long-term things that you must look at if you have to come up with a solution mm. that is going to last. Mm. I, think, I, I think that that is precisely the point that is being made. That, let, let me explain, perhaps I need to go into a bit more detail about the work of the National Economic Council mm. on this livestock transformation plan. As I said, the reason why we had to constitute the governors into where we had to constitute ourselves into a committee was precisely because we recognized that the reason why we have all these clashes between herdsmen and farmers is because of desertification. It's because of, the, of all of the conflict over pasture and water. A lot of that is climate change related. Now, every state controls territory. Every state controls land. And under the Land Use Act, it is a state governor that has absolute control over the land of his state. It is the state governor that gives you permission, even the federal government, whatever you want to do on their land, they must give you development uh, control permit, even if it's on federal land, if you have any land that's federal. Now, that's why we sat with the state governors, and we decided that, look, this is an issue that's almost seasonal, and it's getting worse now because of desertification. Now there's some, especially coming from the Sahel. So I guess the question I was trying to ask was whether there's a policy around desertification and climate oh, change and, and, and what the government is doing to mitigate oh, of course. these things. Of course. That's, of course, clearly there is. And one of the major, one of the major uh, policies is, is, is what is called the Green Wall Project. We have the Green Wall Project, basically to control desertification coming from the Sahel. The Minister of Environment has been working on that for years. Now, the other issue, of course, is that we're also cooperating with our neighbors on, on, on desertification issues. Mm -hmm. That's our, our neighbors in the northern part of, 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 of the, the, in, in North Africa. We're also cooperating with North, northern part of West Africa, uh, Niger, Niger, Chad, etc. And then there's also the project to recharge the Lake Chad, because that's one of the very important projects. And Mr. President is the one who uh, particularly pushed uh, the Lake Chad project, mm -hmm. you know to recharge it because, as you know, the Lake Chad has almost completely shrunk uh, from about 35,000 square meters mm -hmm. to about 1,300 or so square meters. So we need to recharge the Lake Chad from the Congo Basin, and that's mm -hmm. one of the projects. Okay, before we go for a break, I want you to just quickly clarify for me, what is the federal government policy there for when it comes to mitigating this conflict? Is it to have ranches or is it to continue having these grazing corridors? Is it a mixture of the two? It's a, it, it, for now, what we have is a mixture. What we have is a mixture now. Because, but ultimately, what the governors are saying in that in their respective states, they will provide for those who want to do the business of ranching sufficient space to do so. In the interim, they are building earth dams so that cows coming, uh, cattle coming from the north especially going towards uh, uh, the, 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 the river banks. And you find that a lot of these conflicts are in those areas, are able to even, before they get anywhere near there, are able to access earth dams, water from the earth dams, access uh, veterinary care and all of that. So the long-term plan, of course, is to eventually create ranches, but ranches have to be privately owned. Government cannot create ranches. But at the moment, you can't just suddenly one day say, no more grazing, that's the end of it. Immediately, that doesn't happen anywhere. And in all of the places where the problem has been solved, because the governors council that committee, we studied it very carefully. We looked at everywhere where the problem has been solved. It was a gradual process. It's that same gradual process that we're going through. Okay, we will take a quick break. Don't worry.